It's March 9th, March 17th. Yeah, I'm just wishing it were Tuesday. It's March 17th, 2024. And there's a divine appointment for the people of Glenview Church of the Nazarene. The divine appointment is that as we enter into the heart of the Lenten season, we come together to celebrate the reality of Jesus Christ. We're going to be working this hour toward the partaking of the Lord's Supper. And so our hope today is that each of us will give our attention to the person of Jesus Christ and we would allow his work uh, to be appropriated very deeply into our lives. Uh, you do see the announcements with the different time of the year and the Easter season. There are some things that are coming up. Please make note of them. Today's alabaster. Sunday the 31st is Easter offering. And then next Sunday is a baptism service. And if you are interested and would like to be baptized, please let me know today and, or early this week so that I can make the proper preparations. Praise be, Peter says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. That living hope is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Father, we come to you this morning thankful for the fact that we can praise you, praise you because of your great mercy, the mercy that has provided for us a new birth. And we rejoice in the fact that the, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we do have a living hope. So now as we sing together, may the hope of Jesus Christ, may it be more than just words that we sing, but may it come from our heart, and may we rejoice in the fact that we have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, I am um, here as the only one half of the team, and Chuck is at home, and uh, we are so blessed to have Hannah over here, and she is going to play for us this morning. And so let's sing to the Lord. There's power in the blood.
you have your Bibles this morning, I'd invite you to turn to do two different passages of Scripture as we prepare to receive the Lord's Supper at the close of our time together today. I'd like to share with you some thoughts that emerge from the Old Testament, are carried throughout the Old Testament, and Jesus, during the last supper that he has with his disciples, as he celebrates Passover with them, the significance of God's plan unfolds in a fresh new way. So if you would, first of all, turn to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. And we want to read verses 1 through 14. They give us the background of the beginning of the Passover feast that the Jews have celebrated for hundreds and hundreds of years. And we read there in Exodus chapter 12, beginning of verse 1, these words. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb. Each person is to take a lamb. A lamb. A lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor. Having taken account of the number of people there, you are to determine the number, determine the amount of a lamb, a lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood, put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs, the lambs. That same night, they are to eat meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat meat raw or boiled in water, but roasted over fire with the head, legs, and inner organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is still left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Verse 12. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you, a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. And then verse 14 says, This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Celebrate this feast. Celebrate this festival to the Lord as a lasting ordinance. We now turn to the New Testament. Just a few verses there. Matthew chapter 26. And at Matthew chapter 26, verse 17 through 19. On the first day of unleavened bread, that's the day we just read about that was established in Exodus hundreds of years prior. On the first day of the festival of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? We need to make preparations. We need to make preparations for the Passover. Where do you want us to make those? He replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your home. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared 
the Passover. In this New Testament passage, please notice that in verse 17, the question is, what about making preparations for the Passover? And the last verse we read, verse 19, the disciples, just as Jesus had directed them, prepared for the Passover. And today we want to talk about making preparations, making preparations so that we may truly experience the good news that is proclaimed when we partake and celebrate the Lord's Supper. May God's richest blessing be upon the reading of the word and also the study of the word as we continue to worship together. Let's sing about that glorious freedom that we get because of what Christ did for us. Once I was bound by sin's galling fetters. Now, I realize these words are not the same kind of words we use today, but the message is still the same, right? Today's, that, today's language, that'd be, once I was a hot mess. <laughs> That's what that would say, is saying in today's language. Yep. Struggling with all kinds of things, right? All manner of evil. All right. Hannah, I really appreciate Hannah doing this. She didn't know about this. She didn't know about this until a little after 8 o'clock this morning. Chuck's at home. He's in severe pain. He has to use his hands, his other hand to help his hand up to scratch his eye so he can't play. He said there was just no way he could come and play. So if you would pray for him, I'd appreciate it. And I know he would appreciate it. So let her rip, Hannah.
Did you find yourself in that song somewhere? It spoke about all kinds of things. Mine is, um, mine's the third verse, the line where it says, freedom from evil, temper, and anger. There we go. Uh, yeah, those two words, temper and anger, um, that's kind of the, uh, the little um, caption. If you would see a picture of my family, that would be the caption underneath it, you know, a family of anger and temper and... and uh, grow, well, no, not now, no, not now, not now. <laughs> but, you know, that spoke of all the things, all the pitfalls of life, right? All the things that we struggle with. And, uh, you know, praise the Lord. He is able to take us from our previous life, our hot mess of a self, and, and bring us into and help us along the road. Because life is a journey, right? Life is a journey. It's not a, it's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint, you know. Uh, it's a marathon where you think, oh, my goodness, I made it through that mile. Now there's another one coming and another one coming. But we have a finish line. And we have a hope. And he has given us that. And it's because of his faithfulness and his love. And he'll always chase after us. We might be the lamb in the mud. But did you, do you remember the picture? Do you remember him coming and running? after us and this week I have been praying that the Lord would keep running and chasing my loved ones my family that is not uh, where they should be and I hope and pray that you have also been um, kind of basking in that song and what it meant um, and so now is our turn to uh, open the altars up and to um, tell the Lord just how much we love him. And we're going to sing, Father, I adore you. And then it says, Jesus, I adore you. Spirit, I adore you. So the, the Trinity, the three in one, that I cannot even pretend to wrap my head around that. But the Bible says that you can come as a little child. Do children understand everything, the ins and outs of everything? No, they just have faith. If you tell them something, they believe it, right? I have to be careful at school. Yeah, because I'm, you know me, I'm always messing with the kids. So I got to be careful because I think they're going to believe you. So, but I'm glad that we don't have to understand it all because I don't think I ever could. And if it was, if it meant that in order for me to get to heaven, I think I would be terribly hopelessly lost but I'm glad that it doesn't so let's sing Father I adore you Father I adore you I lay my life before you how I love you come if you'd like before you. Before we give you our needs this morning, we give you our hearts. We confess that if we don't first give you our hearts, we tend to ask for needs that may not be in the, 
in line with your will. And so we just take time today to, to lay our lives before you. Because we realize that as we open our hearts to you, that you're going to refill them. If there's anything that is becoming an idol and distracting us from a walk with you, you will reveal it to us. And you'll give us an opportunity to repent, to let go of it, and to once again lay our lives before you. How appropriate in the middle of the Lenten season, we take time to consider our walk with you. And Father, our prayer this morning is that as we continue to move closer and closer to Holy Week, where we take time to remember the fact that Jesus entered into Jerusalem with the crowds saying, glory to God in the highest. But by the end of the week, the fervor had changed. How fickle we can be as human beings. Proclaiming Jesus as Lord in a matter of days, crucify him, crucify him. And Lord, our prayer is that we would not be critical of the crowds, but may we have the courage to think about why the crowds were distracted, and why they were so inconsistent, how the winds of political leadership and the winds of religious thought and discussions of religious theological truths, how that swayed them when in reality they had the opportunity to experience Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of Man, the Son of God. And Lord, that's our prayer today for our congregation. We pray that in the midst of this special time of year, that we would humble ourselves, that we would lay our lives before you, and that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would just become a deeper reality within us and through us. We do pray for the names of the people who have been given to me this morning. We pray for Holly. We pray that you would go to her there in the hospital and touch her as, as she recuperates from the surgery. We thank you for medical doctors that can do such amazing things. But we also pray to the Lord who is the one who is creator and Lord of all. And so we pray that she would bring healing to Holly's body and the recuperation would go smoothly and quickly. And then, Lord, we pray for Craig Scroggins. He's in the hospital, and as he deals with some of the same issues that have come upon him in the past, we pray that you go to the hospital there in Alton, and you would just wrap your arms around him and give Craig the assurance that you love him deeply and that you are caring for him. I thank you for the confidence he has in our church and that he has in me and how he calls and he has a real trust and belief in us as his family of God to pray for him. And then, Lord, we do pray for Chuck. We know that he would love to be here, but he can't. So touch him. Only you know what's exactly going on. And as he works to with the different doctors and specialists as he goes through the tests. May Chuck and Ruth, maybe even the physicians themselves, realize that the ultimate trust is not in them, that we have tremendous confidence in them, that the ultimate hope we have is in Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we pray. Lord, there may be others here today, and there are those who are now at the altar, and, Lord, they feel so deeply for the situations and the people that they've by faith have stepped forward. We pray that you would just minister to them, comfort them, encourage them. May the living hope of Jesus Christ be felt deep within their being. And those of the Lord who we may not have come forward to pray and kneel, but we have concerns. We just reach out to you. We give them to you, Jesus because we realize you are the living hope. In Christ's name.
are seated. I didn't write one of the very important requests that were given to me. Cecil Stacy is not doing well at all. And uh, so let's just pray for Cecil. Uh, miss him. He was always back there. Just His eyes always said, go, Pastor, go. We miss him. Father, we come to you right now. Yes. And I thank you for reminding me. I thank you for the Holy Spirit reminding me to pray for Cecil. Lord, as he has to deal with blood transfusions and as he continues to deal with the fact that he's becoming weaker and weaker, we pray that you would comfort him. We pray that you would encourage him. We pray that his family would realize that Jesus Christ loves their dad, loves their grandfather. And our prayer is that you would use Cecil's humble spirit to just remind them of the hope that he has in Jesus Christ. We thank you for Cecil. Lord, just be very real to him, not only at this moment, but in all the days ahead. And all the people of God said, Amen. 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 And that's thank you so much. We got Ruth has been here since creation. Yes. And then, <laughs> and then on each side of her, she has some Pepsi generation people. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we do thank you, Ruth, for your leadership. And we thank you, Hannah and Andrew, for your willingness to help. If you would like to be dismissed, children, you can go downstairs with Marcy for Junior Church. I think they are, I will see. If it might be possible, I'm not sure what's going on. I make the announcements and then just kind of smile uh, to see what happens. But uh, <laughs> children, if you would like to go back there, Marcy is with, back there waiting for you. So, They were newlyweds. And uh, as they sat together in the kitchen, supper was being prepared. And they were enjoying some conversation and uh, talking about their days and what had happened. And they were having ham that night. And uh, the bride was putting together the ham and getting ready to put it in uh, to the pot in which it would be cooked. And she took a knife and cut off each end. And uh, her husband saw that and he was very curious, and so he asked, Honey, why did you cut the ends off the ham? And her response was, Well, because Mom always did. Well, that wasn't a good enough answer for him, and the curiosity got the best of him. So the next time that they were together with the bride's parents, the curious husband asked his mother, the mother of the bride, Why did you cut the ends off the ham before you cooked it? Well, because my mom did. He still was not satisfied. And so at the next family reunion, he sought out his wife's grandmother. And for a third time, he asked, why did you cut off the ends of the ham before you cooked it? The response was, because my pan was too small for the ham. <laughs> hmm. Isn't it interesting that we do things, we participate in things, and we just do it because, well, that's because it's the way it's always been done. 
in Matthew's gospel, we have that apostle's description of what we call the Lord's Supper. With his 12 disciples, Jesus observes the important custom of the Jewish faith. For centuries, the people of the Jewish faith observed the Passover. They had done it year after year, decade after decade, century after century. Every Hebrew remembers and experienced what it was to come together, to get the family all together, and how they would gather and they would have everything prepared and they would follow very religiously the details of the Passover feast. Now, what's really interesting, Matthew is a Jew. And Matthew is addressing a Jewish audience. Each of the gospel writers has a particular people in which the writer is seeking to communicate with. And Matthew, being a Jew, has a tremendous heart for his Jewish brothers and sisters. And so he writes his account of the life of Jesus Christ from a Jewish perspective. And because he is addressing a Jewish audience, he does not explain all the details that are a part of the Passover feast. He doesn't waste ink. He knows that when he says Jesus' disciples wanted to make preparations for Jesus to observe the Passover, they knew exactly what they were what Matthew was talking about. And in verse 17 of Matthew 26, the key words that we pointed out are make preparations. Where do you want us to make preparations? We are going to eat the Passover. What preparations? Where do you like us to go and make the preparations? And when Dr. or when Matthew says that, he doesn't have to explain it because he's addressing a Jewish audience. And so verse 19, the disciples do exactly as Jesus had directed them, and they prepare the Passover. And so what I would like for us to do today is to turn back to the book of Exodus. We read it together and look at Exodus chapter 12 and look at some of the things that were done as the people of God made preparations for the Passover. And what's really interesting is unless we have a, an idea of the preparations that the Jewish people made in the original Passover feast there in Exodus and all the way through into the New Testament era, we will miss some of the great details and the important insights concerning the Passover, which Jesus transforms in the New Testament to the Lord's Supper. In other words, we're going to do more than partake of bread and drink from a cup today. We are going to participate in a very, very important moment of faith. And I want us together to think through the significance of what is symbolized through the elements of the Lord's Supper of communion so that you and I can have a fresh understanding and a deeper renewal, maybe even a change of heart concerning Jesus Christ. To understand what is unfolding in Exodus chapter 12, let me take just a couple of minutes to remind you of what takes place in Exodus chapters 1 through 11. For 430 years, wow, for 430 years, God's people are in Exodus. And as you read in Exodus 1, the Lord blesses the people. They're not in the promised land. They are in Egypt, and God blesses the people there. In fact, he blesses them so much that they multiply greatly. In fact, chapter 1, verse 7, they multiplied so much that the Jews, the Israelites, were filling the land of Exodus. 
And the number of Israelites was becoming so large, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, his perspective was, if they wanted to, they could take over this country. They could overthrow us. So he gives orders that the Israelites would become slaves to the people of Egypt, and they were to work them ruthlessly. As you read Exodus chapter 1, it's ruthlessly, bitter labor, hard labor. In other words, it was a tough, tough time to be a Jew. Now, what's interesting, you'll find this is true, when you try to assault and beat down the people of God, you know what happens? They get stronger. It's a, you see it in the book of Acts. The early church faced persecution. And as they faced persecution, you know what happened? People just kept moving forward. They went to different places. They spread the gospel. See, true people of God, when things get tough, they don't shrink. They get bigger. Their faith grows. And so we see this. And so they're working the Jewish people ruthlessly. And so Pharaoh understands, well, this isn't working. They're becoming more powerful. And then the next thing is truly amazing. The next thing is, well, let's, let's extinguish their race. And the instructions are given to the midwives. When you Egyptian midwife, when you assist in the delivery of an Israelite baby boy, you throw him into the Nile River and drown him. It was a horrendous time to be born a baby boy in Exodus. Then in Exodus chapter 2, God raises up the one who's going to deliver his people out of slavery. And you know what is so cool? The baby boys were thrown into the Nile River to be destroyed. And you know how Moses' life is saved? His parents hide him for three months. Then they put him in a basket and they set him at the banks of the Nile River and God uses Pharaoh's daughter to pull him out of the river. Isn't God awesome? I'm going to show you something, Mr. Pharaoh. You're going to try and destroy my people through the river. I'm going to bring the deliverer out of that river. In fact, Moses means to draw out of water. Moshe. 80 years pass, 80 years after the death of Moses, and after the birth of Moses, excuse me, there's a, a change in leadership among the people of Egypt, and God calls through the burning bush, calls for Moses to go back. It's time to go to work. Anybody here getting close to 80? It's time to go to work. Now, we're talking about kingdom purposes. But Moses goes back, and he marches into Pharaoh's office and says, My God says, let my people go. And you know what Pharaoh says? Ha! No way, no way, no way. And to summarize what takes place in those First 11 chapters, as we move closer and closer to Exodus chapter 12, God says, okay, Mr. Pharaoh, we're going to have a showdown. There's going to be a battle between your hundreds of gods in Egypt, and you're going to be put in a contest with the true and living God. And what we have are the 10 plagues. And I don't have time to deal with it now, but each one of those plagues is a direct attack on one of the key gods, little g, of the nation of Egypt. And the one that I would like to call to your attention is the first one. Remember what the first plague was? Once again, it involves the Nile River. For the Egyptians, the Nile River was their god. It was the god of their commerce. It was the water supply that enabled the nation of Egypt to experience all the good things of life. And not only does Moses, when he is a baby, brought out of the Nile River, 
the first plague is that the river is turned to blood. And what we find then is a natural outflowing of what would happen if a water source for a people was fun, suddenly turned to blood. Gnats. Of course, the frogs want to get out of there, so they, I mean, it's, it's just a natural outflow. Pharaoh says, no way, no way, you're not leaving. God says, watch me break your heart and break your will. And what we want to focus on then is the 10th plague. The plague of the death of the firstborn. And the plague of the firstborn is described in chapter 11. The bottom line is that uh, the firstborn of every family, be it human or animal, the firstborn will die unless there is an act of faith. That act of faith, God gives the instructions. We read them in chapter 12. The instructions are Hebrew people, this is what you are to do. You are to take a lamb. Would you say it with me? A lamb. Say it again. A lamb. You are to take a lamb that is spotless, and you are going to slaughter it. And you are going to take some of the blood of what? The lamb. And you are going to take a paintbrush, and you're going to paint the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, on the door frame, across the top and down the sides. And by faith, you will do this. You will offer a sacrifice of a lamb. You'll take the blood. You'll paint your door frame with it. And then you are to prepare the meat and to have a feast. Not just a snack. Not just some wafer. But a family reunion. I mean, this is going to be great. In fact, that's what happens through the hundreds of years that take place between the initial Passover feast and what happens when Jesus Christ observes the Passover in Matthew 26. It's what the people anticipate. It's a huge family get-together. All the preparations have to be made. There are herbs that need to be purchased. One of the things that the disciples had to do, they had to go and find a lamb. They had to go somewhere there in Jerusalem, find a place, purchase a lamb. They then had to bring it to the priest who would examine it, make sure that it was spotless. And then the disciples would have had to take the lamb down to the temple. They would have presented it until another priest who would have taken it into the holy place would have slit the lamb's throat and taken the blood and placed it, thrown it, painted the altar with it. See, the, the, the rite goes deeper and deeper from around the house to in the temple. But the thing that we need to remember, the thing that I want for us to understand is it involves a lamb. And the lamb is to be prepared. The lamb is to be slaughtered. And the blood of the lamb is what is significant for to the experience of the Passover. Specific instructions, how to select it, how to slaughter it, how to eat it, even how to burn what remains. The key, the blood of the lamb. Now what's really interesting in verse 7 and verse 11 of Exodus chapter 12, the instructions are, eat the lambs. Verse 11, eat it, referring to the lamb. Eat the lamb. Eat the lamb. What I would like to propose to you is that the lamb, the herbs, the bread, it's a very special time. 
it is a Passover feast. And central to the feast was what? I really want us to get this. Central to the feast of the Passover is what? The lamb. They are to feast on the lamb. And as I thought about that, it's important that we see that the picture is not of a fast food stop to grab a sandwich. The picture is not just a snack that we pick up at a gas station to hold us over until we have time to have a more nutritional meal. God's instructions are feast on the lamb. See, the significance of the lamb, the significance of Jesus Christ, is not that, well, he's just something that can hold us over until we get something else. The centrality of Jesus Christ is that we just don't, you know, nibble just to get enough to get through another three or four days. We feast on the lamb. Jesus catches this in his earthly ministry. In John chapter 6, we have one of the most interesting passages concerning Christ's ministry. Of course, John chapter 6 begins with Jesus feeds the 5,000. A crowd of some 15,000 people, he takes five small barley loaves and two small fish, and he feeds a crowd, 5,000 men plus women and children. And the people are amazed. What a miracle! Whenever we need a snack, we can find Jesus and he'll give us fish sandwiches. See, that's their mentality. We can run to him. And he can hold us over until we run out of spiritual gas next time. And then we'll run to him again. And because of that mentality, Jesus gives a discourse. He talks to the crowd as the people ask questions, as the religious leaders ask questions. Jesus begins to give a discourse in which he says, you know what? You just had some bread. I want you to know, John 6, 35 I am the bread of life. He says it again in verse 47. I am the bread of life. You've just had some physical bread, which gives you nutrition physically. But I want you to understand, he says, there is a deeper truth that is found in me. I'm just not the one who can provide a snack when you're hungry. I am the bread of life. Verse 50, John said, I'm the bread that comes down from heaven. Verse 51, I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. And then notice this, whoever eats this bread will live forever. Will live in the forever dimension. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of of the world. What you talking about, Jesus? Eat your flesh? Yeah. To take you into the center of my system? Yes. Are you teaching cannibalism? Don't be absurd. That's what some of the early people who wanted to destroy the church tried to accuse them of. They say that they eat the flesh of Jesus. They're cannibals. Come on! Jesus is talking about feasting on him. Verse 55, you know what he says? Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. If you take the symbols... Jesus says, my hope is you'll experience the reality and that you will take me and you begin to feast on me. Well, that's kind of tough, Pastor. Well, yeah, you're right. 
Well, how does that chapter end? I'm glad you asked. Verse 66. The feeding of the 5,000. What a great miracle. End of the chapter, verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Jesus says, make preparations, guys. Make preparations. And you are going to find that spotless lamb. You're going to take it through the, through the rituals, and you're going to get an okay, and then it's going to be, have its throat slit, and we're going to take the blood, and it's the blood of the lamb. It's the lamb. It's central. That's me. Feast on me. Not a snack. Feast on me. It gets even better when you look at chapter 12 of Exodus. Not only do we see the instruction, feast on the lamb, we also discover that there is freedom to live because of the lamb, freedom to live, fulfilling God's purposes. Verse 11 says, tuck your cloak into your belt, have the sandals on your feet, have your staff in your hand. In other words, be ready to move. We're going to move. What he is saying is, you are my people. And being my people, you know what you're going to experience as we move forward? You're going to experience coming to a sea and you're going to be so frightened by the fact that the Egyptians are chasing you and that there's, there's a desert on the left and the right and it seems like it's hopeless. You know what you're going to experience because of the lamb? You're going to experience my purposes. And you know what's going to happen? Those seawaters are going to literally split in two. And you're going to walk through on dry land. Wow! It's moving forward. It's a whole different dimension of living. It's living with the fulfillment of God's purposes. You're going to live by faith. You're going to be in need of bread. And you know what's going to happen? Because we're moving forward, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to supply for you. And when you're hungry, you know what's going to happen? There's going to be bread, manna, which is interpretive, what's that? There is bread that's going to fall from heaven. And you're going to eat it. And in your humanity, you're going to store it up because you have to have enough for tomorrow. But I want you to learn to live by faith. And so any that you keep for the next day, when you go to pull it out for breakfast, then it stinks. It's rotten already. It's living the freedom to live, fulfilling God's purposes. You see, when we feast on the lamb, we experience a freedom to live God's purposes we move from the slavery of Egypt to newness of life in the promised land, which is present tense living. In fact, if we were to jump ahead to Exodus chapter 19, we would get a rich understanding of what it means to have the lamb, so part of our lives that we experience the freedom to live fulfilling God's purposes. In Exodus chapter 19, the people of God, they've come through the Red Sea. They've experienced the miracle of having manna, bread come from heaven. They've seen water gush out of a rock. I mean, they've just experienced all these great things of moving forward, and they come to Mount Sinai. And God says, Moses, I want you to come up here. And Moses goes and has a conversation with God. And God tells Moses what his purpose for his people is. And he tells them, what I want you to understand is that I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of Egypt to myself that out of the nations you will be my treasured possession. Oh, and you will be for me a 
kingdom of priests and a holy nation. See, Hebrews were true people just like you and me. We like hearing about being a treasured possession. But God's purpose includes you will be for me a kingdom of priests and you will be for me a model to the nations. You will flesh out what it means to be a holy people because you are a holy nation. I thought he just wanted to get us to the promised land. Promised land present tense. Living in the reality of feasting on the lamb and living in the reality of, of, of fulfilling God's purposes. God's purpose is very central to my life. And when the purpose of God is central to my life, everything that calls for our attention day by day and with each passing moment is no longer a drudgery grind. It's the reality of living the purpose of God. There's one other truth, and these just keep building, so hang on. If you have your Bible still open to Exodus 12, look over at chapter 13, verse 1. Before we read it, here's the, here's the scene. The death angel is going to pass over, and those who have observed the slaughtering of the lamb and have taken and appropriated the blood of the lamb, and it becomes the very thing that protects them. It becomes the very center of their existence. The death angel will pass over, and none of the firstborn of that crowd will die. In other words, hey, guess what? You know what our testimony is? We have trusted the provision of the lamb, and we've invested in the blood of the lamb. And you know what? We're alive. We didn't die. You ready? Look at chapter 13, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me every firstborn male, the firstborn of every womb among the Israelites. Those are the people that were re rescued, that missed the death of the angel. Well, you know what? Those who are now the firstborn who are living, they belong to me. Whether human or animal. Wow. You mean it's not just avoiding death? You mean that this Passover and this feasting on the lamb and the ability to live with the freedom of seeing God's purposes fulfilled through me is built on the fact that I'm under new ownership? You got it. That's it. The people and all connected with the people who by faith apply the blood belong no longer to themselves. They belong to the Lord. Well, that's Old Testament. Hang on, wait a minute. The New Testament affirms that same principle. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 through 20 in the New International Version says this. Do you not know your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you whom you received from God? When you are born again, somebody moves in. It's the Holy Spirit. And since the Holy Spirit lives in you, just don't you understand? That's, your body is different. You, your, your life is different. Verse 19 and 20. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. The blood of the lamb. Since you were bought with 
a price, the blood of the lamb, honor God with your bodies, with your life. You know who owns me? You know who owns everything that I call my possessions? You know who owns my dog? If we are of the firstborn, delivered from the death angel, we're under new ownership. We belong to the Lord. Eugene Peterson's The Message a contemporary paraphrase of what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19 and 20. Didn't you realize that your body or your life is a sacred place? Your life is the place of the Holy Spirit. Don't you see that you can't live however you please, squandering what God paid such a high price for? Your life, your body is not some piece of property. No, your life, everything about your life, God owns all of it. So, let people see God through your life. Through your, through your body. Wow. All the preparations have been made. And as your pastor, in the middle of this Lenten season, my prayer the last week, as I worked through this passage of Scripture, was that I and the people who are the sheep of the flock that God has given me responsibility to lead and to direct and to point would truly take time and examine our lives to see if we feast on Jesus or he's just a snack to keep us going from day to day. It's all seen in what's represented in the preparations. We are going to take together and serve communion as we typically do. Some of the ladies of the church, some of the stewards are going to come here and they're going to sit at the front for just a moment when I call them forward. Ladies, you can come on up right now if you'd like. Take a seat at the front. Each one of us is invited to participate. And based on what we find in the teachings that emerge out of Exodus 12 and throughout the Old Testament, even into the New Testament, my hope is that as you and I partake, that it would be much more than it's something that mom always did. My hope and prayer is that what we do symbolically will be such an act of faith that as we take and eat, as we take and drink, we would experience the very living reality of Jesus Christ. being the purpose of my life and I surrender ownership of my life to him. We celebrate the new birth, what can occur through the cross of Jesus Christ. But because of what we find through the biblical record, we're not only celebrating the fact that we are born again, we are celebrating the fact that we live differently. It's no longer my will and my purpose. It's God's will and God's purpose. 24-7, 365. May we 
feast on the Lamb. Father, we thank you for truth. We thank you for reminding us that when Jesus established the Lord's Supper, he was taking a ritual and bringing a tremendous New Testament depth to it. And Lord, we want to today just get a taste, to get a sense of what we are doing and what it represents. Our prayer is that as we are served the elements, that we will not just see wafers and see grape juice. May we have a depth of understanding that what we hold in our hands are the body and the blood of Christ, symbolically speaking. Give us the grace to do more than observe the Lord's Supper and take communion. Give us the grace to experience Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who enables us and frees us to fulfill the purpose of God through our lives and who actually paid the price and bought us back. Give us the grace to understand that you own us. We belong to you. May this truly be a time, as we sang earlier, of laying my life before you. Father, how I love you. Jesus, how I love you. Spirit, how I love you. I love you so much. May I lay my life before you. In the blessed name of Christ, we pray. And in an attitude of complete surrender and submission, We continue. The ladies are going to come at this time and prepare to serve you. We will follow the pattern we have been using since I've been here. If you are seated to my left, if you will go toward the wall on your right, come forward, move across. You can pick up some of the wafers and pick up a cup. If you are on the other side, same way, move to the wall, come down the aisle, pick up a wafer and a cup. Return to your seat. If you would please hold it after all have been served, I will lead us in partaking. Please stand and just from the front rows, just come on forward, okay? If you can't come, just raise your hand and the ladies will bring it to you.
Has anyone, or does anyone need to be, have the elements brought to you? Just raise your hand. The ladies will come. Everybody get served. Ladies, will serve yourselves. And return to your seat, and then we'll take together. All the preparations have been made. Jesus and his disciples were in the upper room. and They were enjoying that feast. All the vegetables and herbs. And there were the four cups that were served. And everything was going according to what the preparations were. And Jesus throws them a curve. Because he takes the bread... And he breaks it. They pass it around, each one taking a piece. And I have a feeling, he said, do you remember what happened the day I fed the 5,000? This is my imagination running wild. Do you remember that night, that day? And you remember how I told the crowds and answered their question that I am the bread of life? The bread of life that comes down from heaven? And that whoever eats that, partakes of me, feasts of me, will live. They had puzzled looks on their faces like you do. But that's all symbolized in this piece of bread and the wafer that you take, that you have in your hand. The instructions that he gave to his disciples were, please, please, take and eat. And when you eat, remember me. The lamb, take and eat. The Passover feast, there were four cups. They had taken the first cup and they shared together. Second cup was passed around and they all took a sip. Jesus takes the third cup, which is the cup of redemption, and says, Remember out there on the hillside where I said that, that anyone who drinks of my blood? Well, the fruit that's in this cup, the wine that is in this cup, it represents my blood. And what I want you to know, gentlemen, it's the blood of the Lamb. You're aware of that, guys. I mean, you've gone through the ritual for years. And he looks over at Peter and James and John who have scrambled for days trying to get everything ready. And there they, they have the Lamb ready. And he says, all the preparations don't miss the truth. It's the blood of the Lamb. And I'm the lamb who enables you to be set free from the penalty and the power of sin. You are redeemed. You are bought back. Ownership of your life changes hands. So he says, take and drink. And as you do, Remember me, the Lamb gives us those same instructions. Take and drink and remember Jesus Christ, the Lamb. The simple chorus says, Hallelujah. Praise the Lamb. Hallelujah. Praise the Lamb. My heart sings this song over and over. Hallelujah. Praise the Lamb. 
praise the Lamb. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. My heart sings his praise again. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. My heart sings his praise again. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. My heart sings his praise again. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. And after contemplating God's amazing plan and how it includes us, all the people of God said, Amen, Amen. Go in the peace of the Lamb. God bless you.